Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thank you for joining me today. We are in the life of Joseph at a, an amazing turn in his life, an amazing turn coming in the life of Joseph. It's one that looks very similar to some things that are going on right now in our world. So come join us. Let's look at the scripture. I'm not going to cover a lot of it today because we're setting the stage for what's going to begin to unfold when we get to wake up in the word tomorrow. But uh, as we pick up the story, remember the situation. A worldwide famine had struck. The situation was dire. The people were starving. And the only country that had any food was Egypt. And because of God's hand on Joseph, the Egyptians had been forewarned so they could prepare for the lean years under Joseph's leadership. Now, starving people from other lands had begun to trickle into Egypt, begging to buy food. Now, as we get there, I want to stop and set a stage for what's going on right now in the world. We've just undergone a, a, a horrific year. Everyone wanted to forget 2020, but they don't realize that some of the most painful times may lie ahead instead of behind. The world stage is set for uh, interesting pattern of economic collapse, joblessness, homelessness, and other things that are about to occur. We got a president that signed perhaps more executive orders within the first 24 hours than any president in history. And among some of the things that he's promising to do includes some ridiculous new taxes that you'd never thought anyone could dream up. Now, all of those I don't think will get passed, but what you're going to have is a situation where the economy has been slaughtered by the shutdowns. Many businesses are closed forever. They will never reopen. In the case of some of you who've been out of work for a long time, you're on that growing list of people that are behind on your rent and on your mortgage payments. The effect of how this is going to trickle through society is amazing. One of the first things our new president did was push down the road all of the folks who are behind on rent. No, you can't evict them. Well, the problem is the people who would be evicting them, now seen as the evil landlords, are people who probably don't own that property outright themselves. They no longer can make their payments, their expenses, can't even repair the place because they have no income coming in on it. And many of them will be losing those properties that now will belong to, I guess, just the banks. And as these, this begins to change over in society, who eventually is going to own that property? And when they do, and when finally the restrictions are off and people have to start paying rent, many are in double digits behind ten, twenty thousand dollars in the hole on their their rent that they owe, who will be able to pick up and pay it at that point? Are we going to have uh, just a tremendous civil upheaval because of this cycle alone going through society? And are we going to continue to see uh, business failures? You know, it's amazing. Some companies, tech companies and others, it's amazing that the auto manufacturers are doing great right now because folks that do have money are just swamped with it and want to spend it while you've got a large set, section of the population. Latest survey, over 50% of people said they did not have enough money around that if they had an emergency that would cost $1,000, they couldn't pay for it. Over half the population saying they're in that bad shape financially. We're hanging on by our fingernails in some places. But those who were rich seems to, seem to have gotten richer. We, we uh, apparently elected a president based on his promise to tax those rich people and find some way to get money out of their hands and into ours. Yet it doesn't look like that's where we're headed. Instead, things like the instant raising of minimum wage to $15 in some place, where it sounds good on the surface, like it's, oh, it's going to really help me. If I'm making $8 an hour, I'm thinking, wow, you almost doubled my paycheck. It's really more of a scheme to double the amount of payroll taxes that you now pay. And what's going to happen is many of these employers who are stretched to the max as well. Many of them have already shut down, but especially the small employers, they're going to be faced with having to pay employees even more. I, I talked to someone in a little store over here in a small county seat town, not mine, but another one uh, about what they were doing as they faced what might be coming down the road if this was enacted. And they said, basically as a business owner, I'll either have to live over here with my business and cut my my staff in half, or maybe even by more, or I will just have to go out of business. 
And this is what a lot of employers are facing. They don't have a huge margin right now. So we're looking at a crisis in our nation. And why am I even talking about this in regard to Joseph? Because there was a worldwide crisis going on in Joseph's time. And because God had prepared the hearts of certain people, certain people to prepare for it, get ready, then many lives would be saved. My thought is, how many Josephs do we have out there today that have prepared for a time such as this? I think most of us could not have imagined something going on like has gone on in 2020 and will be going on in 2021, nor how we should prepare for it or how we should react to it. Without Joseph, the world would have been at a time of starvation, and instead God had used him to provide food in a time when food would be scarce. Now, what's God doing with you and I? Uh, Even now, is he preparing us for what's to come? Some of the dark times that are on the horizon that's going to put even more people at risk all around us, and what are we going to be doing about it? Is the church strong enough to handle what's going to be happening in its communities, or is the church so weak because it has been missing the mark on paying attention to what God's doing in his world? Is the church so weak that it's going to be like many of those businesses that are going under? Well, who knows? But in these kind of days of of dire straits for many people, families, homes, and communities, someone has got to step up and make a difference. And that's where we find Joseph. Well, not only do we find Joseph is making a difference in Egypt, but now something really changes in where we're going to be looking from the scripture. Now, listen to the way Chuck Swindoll describes this. He said, Meanwhile, the spirit-directed camera of the Holy Scripture leaves Egypt and adjusts its zoom lens on a hamlet in Hebron, back in the land of Canaan, back in the place of Joseph's childhood, which he was forced to leave now over 20 years ago. Mm. Pick it up with me in Genesis chapter 42, beginning in verse 1. It says, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Oh, it's a difficult situation. Get out of here. Head down to Egypt. Get us some food. It says, Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. That's that younger, the youngest, the last son of Rachel. Did not send Benjamin instead, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Friends, regardless of where you are, the famine that's going to hit the world is going to affect you. Now, maybe more in some places than others. You go out to California today and you can see the homeless crisis at its peak. You can see in some cities on the West Coast uh, riots and towns still on fire, it seems like, in a couple of places where it seems like people are just expressing their anger about who knows what from anarchist to whatever. I I mean, the world seems to be crumbling in some places. In other places, it seems very normal. Even around our town, where we may have some restaurants and other businesses that are closed or restricted from what they used to be, life seems to go on pretty much as normal. The kids may be wearing masks, but at least they're going to school here, where in some of you that are listening to me, your children can't even go to school. They have to try to figure out how to learn on a computer screen. How's that working for you? Probably not too well. And as we wrestle with all these problems, the fact is when a worldwide, in this case famine, but in our case economic catastrophe hits, it trickles down to everybody, even in the little hamlets far away. Because, of course, in this case, the food supply chain has dried up and there is no food to be had. Now people's bellies are aching and they're hurting. And in the midst of all this, someone's got to step in and make a difference. Well, right now, you may be living in one of those places you say, well, I'm glad I live where I I am. I'm in this little small town in the backwoods of Kentucky or Tennessee or South Carolina. Oh, this stuff's not going to affect me. Oh, it will. The next time you start going to 
uh, the store and finding that the shelves keep having different holes, as we used to call them in the grocery business, place where there's no merchandise in certain sections. The supply chain gets stretched, it gets thin. And then the groceries you can buy have a higher price tag and they start sneaking up on you. You've probably noticed the price of gas going up. Yes, the, one of the first things the president did was can an oil pipeline project that was going to bring the wonderful rich resources of Canadian oil into the United States, help keeping the supply down, making sure that North America is energy independent instead of dependent. And instead, we've killed over 10,000 good paying union jobs in one day shut down this project that was going to help to keep our energy independence up and instead push us back into a time where we're going to be dependent on other nations. And by doing so has really angered some folks north of the border that were a part of the Canadian end of this, this project, as well as many of the families who are going to be affected by it by losing their jobs. How does this trickle down into an economy? Well, it begins to work slowly at first and then becomes like a tidal wave as it sweeps over the nation. That's why some are predicting that even though we're at stock market highs right now, we're facing within the next year or two what might look bigger than the Great Depression. Just depends. Will governments continue to just print money in mass and try to print their way out of this? Well, right now, the, the United States deficit is larger than even the economy of Australia all put together, larger than entire nation's economies, and it keeps growing because we're pushing this into uncharted territory of debt as we print more and more money. What's that going to do? It's going to make your money worth less and less. Where's this going, my friends? Well, it's not going to be pretty. And just as in Joseph's day, there has to be a time where someone says, hey, I need some help. Where do I go for the help? Where's Joseph in this day? And they have to find a place of refuge. Now, don't you think about Joseph and his family, what they've been thinking about over the last 20 years. Have the brothers been able to completely forget what they did in their younger days to their brother? Or is it haunting them? We're going to find out that they have not lost the ability to have their conscience awakened. They, they're already feeling, you know, we did a terrible thing back then. And, and even wondering if God not, has not been punishing them because of it. They, they have been held, they've held this secret all this time. Jacob, or as he's known now, Israel has no idea what his sons did. And, and you can feel the despair within the family as the, as the conversations just pop up. What about old Joseph? Does he think and wonder? wonder how dad's doing. Is dad still alive? What about those brothers of mine? And wonder what's going on back home in Canaan. You know, those kind of things are about to come together in an amazing story, one that has been on the cinema stage and movies been made out of it for years because of its beauty and its drama. Yet within it, we're going to find some spiritual lessons that are amazing. And I hope you're still maybe jotting down some of those ways that Joseph is looking like Jesus. Because friends, when we get down to the biggest crisis of all that's taking place around us, it's a spiritual crisis. It's the fact that people are trying to solve these problems without God. And the fact is, we need to be pointing them toward the only person that can really help from the big scope of things, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not just a Messiah for the Jews. He's the Savior of all mankind. And during a time of crisis, people not only need food for their bellies, but they need food for their souls. So my friends, let's point people to Jesus. And in this day and age, every day as we wake up in the Word, let's look at different ways in which He's trying to say to us as the people of God today, get up, get off your, get off your duff, Quit thinking just about yourself, being selfish enough to say, well, have I taken care of my four no more, you know? Can we hide out as hermits up here and survive while everybody else dies? I mean, you know, get into the idea that we are a part of God's community that is supposed to, like Joseph, be blessing those around us in our times of distress. Well, it's a tough challenge. We're going to see how Joseph dealt with that challenge tomorrow. But for right now, I want to say, hang in there. Keep looking up and keep being a part of the solution and not the problem.
I'll see you again tomorrow right here as we wake up in the Word.